entered Niels Bohr. So in 1913, Niels Bohr combined the Rutherford atom with Planck's quantum hypothesis. As will be demonstrated, this theory provided a very compelling explanation for the observed hydrogen spectrum. It had two basic postulates. The electron can only revolve around the nucleus in certain allowed orbits. Each orbit represents a stationary energy state that does not radiate energy. The second one was the emission or absorption of radiation occurs when an electron jumps to a different orbit. The change in energy is represented by the energy of the photon emitted or absorbed. And this is characterized as the energy final minus the energy initial is equal to h nu, being the energy of the photon. So let's take a look at what this meant in practice in terms of developing a theory for the atom. All right, so remember at the time we were looking at the Rutherford model of the atom, which Rutherford had just discovered that most of the space inside the atom was just empty space and that we would have something along the lines that looks more like akin to a solar system where we have a very dense nucleus sitting in the center and we have electrons that are flying around in circular orbits around the atom. And of course we've already seen the problems with this, with this picture. And so Neil had his two postulates which essentially describes the, the quantization of angular momentum and that when electrons jump from orbit to orbit, then they either accept energy or they radiate energy. And so we're going to apply those two postulates to the Rutherford model of the atom, and we're going to then figure out what that gives us in the end, how that changes the model of the atom to something that actually is akin to a modern interpretation of what an atom looks like. So for this model, what we're going to do is we're going to start with some classical physics. I'm just analyzing that the electron is moving around in a circular orbit, and it's going to have some velocity v as it moves around in that orbit, and that velocity is tangent to the circle it's moving on, and that there is also an electrostatic force, and that's basically what's keeping it inside the orbit, and that points directly to the nucleus. And so if I use Newton's second law, sum of the forces is equal to the mass times the acceleration. Well, the sum of the forces in this case, that's just the electrostatic force, and I can write that as 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught times the charge of the nucleus times the charge of the electron all over r squared. The acceleration that's acting on my particle is going to be multiplied by the mass of the electron, and the acceleration on the electron in this case is v squared over r. And so all I'm going to do here is I'm just going to substitute in for qn and qe because they both have the same charge and that charge is the elementary charge. So I'm writing 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught. On the other half of this equation I'm just going to have e squared over r squared. And again the e squared in this case is just 1.602 times 10 to the min minus 19 coulombs. Because again, the same, it's the same charge um, on both the nucleus and the electron. Of course, one is negative and the other one's positive. But in this case, we're only figuring out what the magnitude of this force is. So the fact that one is negative and one is positive is not relevant. On this side, again, I'm going to get the mass of the electron, the velocity of the electron, divided by r, which is the radius of the orbit. And I can write that down in my picture. I will change color to write that down. But in this case, that's r. So Bohr's first postulate essentially says that the angular momentum is quantized. And so the angular momentum is usually denoted as a capital L, and I can write it as Me, so the mass of the electron times the velocity of the electron times the radius of the orbit. And what he said was is that that's quantized according to N h, which is Planck's constant, divided by 2 pi. So what we're going to do is we're going to rearrange this and solve for the velocity. So we're just looking at this part right here. We're going to solve for the velocity, which means that v is equal to n h over 2 pi times, or divided by the mass of the electron, divided by the radius of the orbit. And we're going to take that value, this value of v, and we're going to stick it back into here. 
because our goal in the end in this in this derivation or in, through this process is we're going to first figure out what is the radius of each of these orbits. And so in this case I've had two equations and two unknowns and now I can solve for the radius because I didn't know what the velocity of the orbit was. And so now that I have an expression for the velocity given by Bohr's first postulate, we can now solve for the radius. So I'll continue writing out this equation. I've got on the left hand side 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught e squared over r squared and that's equal to mass of the electron divided by r and then I'm going to substitute in for v squared so I'm going to have n squared h squared all over 4 squared 4 pi squared mass of the electron squared radius squared. And right away of course I can start canceling out terms on this right hand side. I can cancel out a mass of the electron on top and cancel out a squared on the bottom. I also have an r over here and I have an r squared so I'll turn that into an r cubed. So what I'm going to do now is I'm just going to group together all of the r terms onto one side and I'm going to then groove all the terms to the other side. So on the right hand side I have r times r squared so that's r cubed. I'm going to multiply both sides by r cubed, so I'm going to get r cubed divided by r squared. And then on the right hand side, I'm going to multiply both sides by 4 pi epsilon naught and divide both sides by e squared. And so what that ends up giving me in the end is 4 pi epsilon naught n squared h squared all divided by 4 pi squared mass of the electron e squared. And then of course I can cancel out the r cubed on top on the left hand side with the r squared on the bottom. I have 4 on top, 4 on the bottom. I have a pi on top, I have a pi squared on the bottom so I'm going to cancel out that squared. And so what that means in the end then is that I'm going to get r is equal to epsilon naught n squared h squared all over pi me mass of the electron times e squared. So in the end what this tells us is that now that we have this n which is a number that basically goes from n is equal to 1, 2, 3, it's any integer number. Again this is about the quantization of the angular momentum and that's where this n came from in the first place. What this tells us is that the radius of the Bohr orbits are quantized, which in and of itself is a quite a phenomenal thing that falls out of this. Again, this idea of quantization also relates to spatial position of where the electrons can, can situate themselves inside this model of the atom. And so then another piece of information that can also come out of this is that the smallest orbit um, is when n is equal to 1. And this is traditionally called the Bohr radius. And so if I were to put in 1 for n and substitute in for all of these variables, then what I would get for the Bohr radius is 0 0.529 angstroms, which is essentially the, the distance away from the nucleus the electron um, is in the Bohr model of the atom, in the first orbit, in the ground state of the atom.